Welcome to the Great Revival. It took years, but I think you will agree it has all been worth it. I'm Henry Clark, rector of this parish, and this is the wonderful St. Lawrence Church, or as I like to call it, Northfield Church, but more on that later. How times change. Oh, and in case you don't know what year it is, we're in 1879. Now let's start with the floor and work our way up. There at your feet, you can see Minton and caustic tiles, beautiful things that keep their shape and color despite the hundreds of years of worshippers walking across them. Tiles like these were prominent in Victorian architecture and the 1800s were awash with them, and why not? They are very beautiful and their addition was one of a number of improvements we made. Other alterations included raising the high altar, once again having a choir, and defining the special nature of the sanctuary by returning a rood screen. Out went the old box pews, and a more practical arrangement was introduced due to the continual growth of the village. These modifications all happened during my tenure, but before that, very little had actually happened since the 13th century. I didn't come along until 1829, so you can imagine what it was like. I was born in 1804, very far from here in the East Indies, and I was the fourth son of Major General Sir William Clark. Unfortunately, he died when I was four, and I followed the respectable path of any fourth son of the times by seeking a life serving the church. First stop was Trinity College Dublin, then Oxford. Then in 1829, I arrived here as a young curate, here at St. Lawrence Church. There is actually some confusion surrounding the name, even though from the earliest of days it was dedicated to St. Lawrence. And this is because in the Worcester Chronicles of 1782, it is recorded as St. Michael. Some suggest this is because the wealthy folk to the south had their own chapel of ease, which was St. Michael and All Angels, and it's still there at Cofton Hackett. Having their own chapel saved them journeying to this one, and perhaps the two got confused. History has since corrected it, but for my part, I call it Northfield Church and keep things simple. When I arrived, change was happening in society, as well as the Victorian factories and forges that drove the country on. Grand houses were being built by the men of industrial wealth, such as Mr. Cadbury, and new builds were erected at the bottom of the hill just before Selly Oak on what you now call the Bristol Road. There was also a revival in the church, which saw the great designers and architects of the time reaching back towards the Gothic tradition of church buildings, as well as taking ideas and inspiration from medieval times. The result would challenge not only how the buildings looked, but also the way in which we worshipped after the puritanical years following the Reformation. You may have heard of the Oxford movement, Perhaps you also heard about how many of my peers converted to Roman Catholicism. Times indeed very much changing. For me, I chose my own style of transformation by focusing my efforts on this small church and the people it served, both in terms of how it looks, but also by way of liturgy. I am happy to say it was very successful. My proudest achievement was, however, the glass. Each window holds a story and each story is a fine example of the great craftsmanship of Hardman Studios of Birmingham, a business we had a fantastic working relationship with as we gave the church its new look. This one window brings us back to 1850 when it was erected. Some think it depicts George and the Dragon, but I can assure you it is St. Michael. I made it a personal mission of mine to have all the glass in the church tell a story, to have an order, and I'm proud to say that we have the entire adult ministry of Christ to gaze upon from baptism, through transfiguration, to death on the cross, rising in glory and ascension to heaven, woven through with examples of his teaching, healing and miracles. And we did the whole thing in 10 short years, a triumph. Both myself and my wife Agnes were delighted with the result. Have I told you of Agnes? Oh, she is a delight herself. She was the daughter of church warden, Dr. John Johnson and his wife, Anna, and when I was appointed rector in 1834, we were allowed to move into the parsonage. What a house that was, I can tell you. A hundred acres of glebe land, a household of six in service, and the house itself had been restored the century before by our predecessors. It was magnificent, and we had a wonderful time on the whole. Unfortunately, within just a few short years from moving in, Dr. Johnson died. The east window marks his passing, but it is not the one you see today. The splendid one on display to this day honours his wife, who lived with us in the rectory until her death in 1878. As for the remainder of the church, well, I was determined to look to his very beginning 
and then his life beyond the tomb. The nativity was a gift from children orphaned and looked after within the parish. The gift of the Magi, my favourite window, is there in honour of my father, and I very much would like to see windows depicting the Annunciation and presentation in the temple, but only time will tell. After so many glorious years here in service, some much change and still so much to do, perhaps words from Dimitis would be a fitting epitaph. Lord, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Let thy servant depart in peace. Well, my time grows short and time will continue to change this beautiful church and the people within it. As you continue, perhaps you will discover whether our earthly wishes come to fruition after our passing. I bid you good day.